I am free. I am free. Yeah, I lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Yeah, I lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Yeah, I lost another one. I am free. Oh, I. So good to praise the name of Jesus Christ together this morning. I just want to share something real quick before we continue with worship. Um, something's been on my mind for the past few weeks, and that's that we belong, and that we have a place in the Father's house together as a community. And my prayer this morning for everyone here today is that we're continually reminded of that, and how great our Lord is, and that He loves each and every one of us the same. And it's something that we'll never understand, but it's something that we should live for. So as we sing this next song, just put your heart in that posture. And remember the greatness of our Lord.
Heavenly Father, you are so holy. You are merciful and mighty, powerful, great is your name above all nations, every tribe and every possible authority on this earth. We praise you and we lift up your holy name, Lord Jesus. We pray today, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just fill this room and that it would just speak to us. Give us the knowledge of you, Lord Jesus. Help us to just understand the power that you have to guide our lives. Help us to know exactly the path that we are supposed to be on, Lord. I just pray that this fellowship would just change lives and change hearts. If there is anyone in here or online seeking your face, wondering, questioning, looking at the world around us and saying, there's got to be something better than this. May they hear, may they feel your presence, may they hear your voice audibly, if possible, Lord Jesus, so that they can be changed forever and know that you are Savior. You have every authority here on earth and in heaven. I pray that this message would just be anointed, that you would just prepare our hearts to hear what you have for us to hear today, Lord, and that we would walk out of this room ready to do your will, to be in your holy presence all week long. We love you, Lord Jesus. It is in your mighty and powerful name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You may now be seated. Thank you for worshiping with us. I'm grateful you're here today as we end up um, our series, Get Your Acts to Gather. We've been looking at a number of things in this series. I, I want to give you a quick recap, and if you haven't joined us before, I encourage you to go back and listen to each of these messages, uh, whether you're here in person or online. And uh, I want to give a couple pre-message things then too. So let me, let me just give you the, the recap of this series. When we began this series several weeks ago, this is focused around the, the issue of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, when God birthed the church. And we found out, first of all, that God activates his church. And how does he do that? By calling us to repent. We found the Holy Spirit came. Uh, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would come upon people in order to uh, enable them to do particular acts for God. And now God says, I'm taking up residence in you. So now for us as believers in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is in us, assisting us to glorify God in our lives and transforming us from the inside out. And so we saw God activating the church, creating the church, birthing the church. And after Peter preached and and explained what was going on, people said, what must we do? And the number one thing is to repent, to turn from how we were living and turning towards Almighty God and follow him wherever he leads us to go. So we saw God activating the church. The second thing we saw a couple weeks ago with Pastor Justin was God develops his church by committed relationships that are like a contract. This isn't just a a transactional kind of thing, but there are relationships that are established, and it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Four main things that the church was supposed to focus on, that the church was actively doing. We're gonna get back to that in just a few minutes, but this is almost a contractual relationship. It's like a marriage that's come together. The third thing we looked at last week with Dr. Lewis was that God accomplishes the greatest impact by us doing life together. The greatest impact comes not by being a lone ranger, not by individual faith, but by us doing relationships together. I I, I thought about this. I've observed the church for the last 40-some years, longer than that, but in ministry for the last 40-some years. And there are things that have burned my heart as I've watched it. 
And I, I, I want to just open my heart to you today, be very vulnerable about where I see the church, especially in America. For I fear, I fear that we lost sight of what we should really be about. A lot of years ago, there was some well-known preachers, and if I named their names, you would know them. But they basically created a concept in the church growth movement that the whole purpose of church is to create a church for unbelievers, that we, we should be a place where unbelievers want to come. Now, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm really glad you're here. And if you're watching online, I'm really glad you're here. But the number one thing for the church, the term itself means called out ones. And if that's true, then we should be gathering to function as called out people. What I fear is over the last number of years is that it's been more reflective of almost a 20th or 21st century marketing strategy than it is about being a group of people that is here to honor and to glorify and to exalt Almighty God. So in that, what should we focus on? In light of that, I, I thought about, what if, we, what if we functioned in our families the way we do church sometimes? Now, I, I want to be clearly understood, so I, I, but I'm not going to be, so it's okay. <laughs> but I hope you hear my heart. I'm really glad we have online, and if you're watching online today, I'm really glad you're here. I, I'm glad we have online services for those that cannot get out, they are homebound, or they have a severe illness and cannot be amongst crowds, and I'm really glad we have our service for that. I'm really glad that we have online broadcasts for when we go away and we can stay connected to our family. I, I, I'm really glad that that can be a portal by which we, we can broadcast out to people that may be in a whole different area of the world. What I'm concerned about is since COVID, it feels like there's a number of people that believe that online services are the way to go and I can have a great convenience and I don't need to be among God's people. I don't have to go. I'm not saying that critically. I'm saying that because I want more for people. I want more. What if we ran our families that way? Hey, I'm gonna pop in every six weeks to be with y'all, but the rest of the time, I'll FaceTime you from time to time and it's great. Would you like to be in a family like that? where key members of your family say, I don't need to be with you. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pop in FaceTime or whatever with you. Now I realize military families and others have to do that, but they have to do that for a period of time for a reason, but that's not how to run a family. Uh, and so when I, when I think about this, what is God telling us about his church? Because a number of people have told me Oh, I'd love to be a part of the church if it was like the Acts 2 church. I'm glad you feel that way. Because I want to talk about the Acts 2 church. Because what I've noticed is I've spent an inordinate amount of time probably, but not inordinate, but I found, and the word I want to talk about today is the word attract. The word attract. It's the number one of our act words. We talked about activate and contract and impact, but I want to talk about attract. Because what I found as I've looked at this, and then I've spent an awful lot of time both in the Gospels, watching the life of Christ and how he spent his time, and then the church as it spent its time, here's what I found. That God gives us at the end of this paragraph that we've been looking at in Acts, he gives us clearly something that Stephen Covey in a book that I read years ago called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which some people have dismissed the book because he's Mormon by background, but I just want to remind us God can use anybody to communicate truth. And as we look at that book, here's what he said. One, one of the habits is this, start with the end in mind. You've got to start with the end in mind. How can you figure out how you're going to function if you don't have an idea of where you're going? And so with the idea of starting with the end in mind, I want to read the last couple verses of this chapter, this paragraph. And here's what it says. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God 
and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. Here's the end of mine. The Lord added to their number daily those that are being saved. Not the church functioned in such a way to attract people to add to the church, but the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. In fact, that's a consistent message throughout the scripture. When God birthed the church, it was clear he wanted to build his church. Jesus said the same thing to Peter and the disciples earlier when they were up at Caesarea Philippi asking the question, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, yes, upon that testimony right there, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But not upon this rock, you'll build my church. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Paul wrote a similar thing to the Ephesians when he says in chapter four, so Christ himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastor teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Christ is giving giftedness to the church to every believer, so that he might build his church. He desires to build his church, but it's his to build, not ours. In fact, at one point in John chapter 12, I was reminded that our main task is to lift up Jesus. And you look at Peter's message, he talks about the cross. You look at the testimony that is given throughout the book of Acts, it's focused on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, at one point when he was talking to them about where he was headed, there was a voice that came from heaven because Jesus has said, Father, glorify, yourself, glorify your son. And he said, the voice came and said, uh, he said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said it to show the kind of death he was going to die. Jesus said again, when I am lifted up, I will draw. I will build my church. I will gift my church. I will draw people. The attraction to Jesus is by the work of Jesus. So what do we do? What's our responsibility in all this? Last night I asked our Saturday night crowd, what drew you to Christ? What drew you to Christ? For me, as I listened to preaching that lifted up Jesus, I was seven years old and I felt the weight of my own sinfulness and the realization that no matter how much I tried to please my parents and other people, I was running fast and jumping high and I could never get there and therefore I knew I could never please Almighty God. And so I felt the weight of my sin and I had people through the years say, how much sin could you commit at seven years old? Well, about the same amount you can commit when you're 70 years old. Because if a heart is not dedicated toward Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you're doing. But I felt the weight of it. That's what drew me with the hope and the promise that if I was willing to confess my sin, he's faithful and just and will forgive me I sin and purify me from all unrighteousness. And man, I wanted that. I wanted to be fully accepted. And what I want for every person that I know today is to know what it is to experience the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, a power that transforms. If anyone's in Christ, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Everything's become new. But I find that people have been in church for a long time, and they have no assurance of that. They wonder if God will accept them someday. And I get that. I've been there. They, they feel like God has abandoned them in the midst of life when challenging times come. And I'm here to reassure you, he has never abandoned you. He has always been with you. I want more for people. So as I look at what the church has done, what the church focuses on, I want to give you three things out of this passage, and then I want to give some great application, because brothers and sisters, I have felt the weight of what many seem to be feeling like, 
life is just heavy. And what I find is so many people are weighed down and they're tired and they pull back. And I find that when we pull back, what burdens me are the people that isolate and stay away and say, but I watch online. I get that. But I can't give you a hug online. I can't give you a word of encouragement online. I can preach, but I, I can't listen to your heart and say, but don't you know that here's what Jesus says right here. I, I can't honor you when you're not in front of me. I can't serve you when you're not in front of me. We need to be together. We need to gather. And that's where the power comes from. When we come together and the church of God focuses on the glory of God, and as we seek his face, listen to the spirit of God, he will open up all kinds of opportunities to evangelize people as we go. But we need to gather to seek his face. We need to focus on these things. The first thing the church focuses on is public and private, single-minded devotion. The first part of verse 46 says this. Every day, I don't like it when preachers do this, but I'm gonna do it. Say every day. <laughs> you know some preachers, they always are having you talk back. It's okay. It's a... What was that word? Every, every day. Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Every day. They were doing church every day. You say, Pat, I can't do church every day. I got a life. I get that. And this was a unique situation where they were there for the feast of Pentecost. And so this was like vacation time. But they, as the church was birthed, and people from all over the world were there, and there's at least 3,120 people in this first gathering of believers, because 3,000 were added to the church that day, and there was about 120 in the upper room when all that took place. You find there's you know, over 3,100 people here, but they knew something new had happened. Something changed. And now suddenly, they're meeting together every day at church. And not only that, so there's, there's public gatherings, but it says that word, they continually met. Back up in verse 42, they devoted themselves. Same word. They continued is the same word for devotion. They put great attention to this. They were passionate about it. Our mission says that we want to engage every person to become a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. So they devote themselves. Listen, if we watch online, and again, I'm not being critical if you're watching online. Please continue to watch online. I just want more for you. I want you to be here. And if you can be here, I want you to be here. Because I hear people tell me, but Pat, I can get four or five teachings. It's not just about teaching. And all teaching is not about words being spoken to your ears. Teaching is modeling. Teaching is demonstrating by doing life together. Teaching is mentoring. But they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, yes, but they also devoted themselves to the fellowship, to the doing life, to sharpening each other, to helping to feed each other, to share whatever else was needed in life for each other. There's so much more. The fellowship, the remembering his death and resurrection through communion, and prayer, when we do prayer together, all heaven is unleashed when the people of God pray. When all these weights of life are coming against you, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. God is anxious to do that for us. But those practices can only happen when we are Together, together. And so they devoted themselves single-mindedness of doing that. In fact, when it says 
they continually met together. The word means to rush along in unison. It's like, it's like when those bulls are chasing people in Spain. If you're out in front of them, you're going to run because you don't want that bull to get you. And so they, they rush together, but it's, it's a word that talks, it's a musical term that talks about a symphony. The Holy Spirit is tapering the corporate times that we are together. And, and he is taking all of us who are uniquely different, but you have things to contribute, and you have things to contribute, and you have things to contribute. And when we rush together as a group of people who are listening to the Spirit and He's directing, what a beautiful song God puts out into the world. But if we're apart from each other, we're missing the horns, or we're missing the flute, or we're missing the strings, and the symphony isn't as strong. We need to be together. And not only did they do corporate times, but they so badly wanted to be with other people, they would eat meals together. They would get in each other's homes. They were doing life together. See, here's the bottom principle. You're gonna be like the people you hang with. And let me just give an ouch to all of us, me included. There are these things. And there are these things. And you got your computer, and you got your smart TV, and you got all your stuff. Now, how many people would admit, and you don't have to raise your hand, we'll have an altar call later, <laughs> that you get on this thing and you go down rabbit holes. And you jump from YouTube to YouTube to YouTube to reel to reel to reel to site to site to site and you're listening and you're seeing this Instagram influencer and that person and you just keep going down from place to place to place to place to place and suddenly two hours later you say, oh my goodness, Pat, you don't understand my life. I don't have time to open my Bible. I can't be at church every week. I've got life to do. I've got things to do. And yet we get lost. And again, I'm not laying guilt on anybody. I can be guilty of that too. And I realize it takes laser focusedness to say, I need to not allow those things to so easily entangle me and trip me up in life. I need to stay focused on the glory of God in my life. And what we find is the church was doing that. And they didn't have this stuff back then, but they had other things to distract them. And you walk through the book of Acts and you'll find the same thing took place. They would have people that get caught up. They, they had Acts chapter 4. What we find is when, when, when people were arrested. See, God gives opportunity. When, when we are focused this way and the church is praying, Peter and John were going up to one of these times that they were going to meet on a daily basis. And as they're going up, they heal this guy, this beggar. And they're arrested for doing that. Anybody been arrested for your faith lately? It's coming. But when that happens, what's the church do? The church prays. And doors open in prisons. And they're let out. And God uses it as a grand opportunity for them to give a witness. In chapter 5, you find that somebody lied about their giving a church. And they were able to deal with it together. God dealt with it, but they were there together. But they were concerned about the fact that the folks took that step. Because the Holy Spirit was working among them to say, no, I want a holy church. And, and you go chapter 6, chapter 7, and, and Stephen is out giving a witness. And as they are persecuted and the church is spread, God gives the opportunity for us to give the witness, but the church has to be empowered with a changed life. What will draw you to Christ more than anything is to deem somebody that you know what they were, but you see who they are. How did that happen? Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ. And that's what the church was focused on. And look what happens. When we come together this way, the church experiences joy and simplicity of heart. It says they ate together in their homes. They broke bread together with glad and sincere hearts. That word for glad is used an awful lot in the scripture. 
I don't know if you've had times when, when your skin just gets so dry that it, it cracks and it, it hurts, or you just, you just had a lot that you've been doing and your muscles are sore and you put some oil on or you put some sap on and you, get, you rub that in and that's just like, ah. Oh. That's what this word is used for, to talk about the oil of gladness. Kings were anointed with oil. Prophets were anointed with oil. But it was a healing thing. When we come together, I carry hurts, you carry hurts. Judy Weed on our staff, this past week, her mom passed. 102. What a life. Can you imagine what she's seen in her life? But I'll never forget, Judy just said to me, I'm so grateful that whether it's joys and sorrows, we can share these times in the body of Christ. Whatever you carried in here today, you are going to be better because Jesus Christ is working in his body. You can be encouraged. I remember years ago, I had a lady come up to me. She's a single mom, went through a horrible divorce, and it was really hard, and she had three kids, and she said to me, for you guys, this is an add-on, but for me, this is lifeline. I couldn't survive if it weren't for me coming together with God's people. Maybe you feel that way today. I'm glad you're here. Because you see, you can't get that if you're not here, if you're isolated, if you're not connected. But the church experienced the oil of gladness, and we experienced that together. The other thing it says, experienced with glad and sincere hearts. The word for sincere is an interesting word. Anybody ever stumped your toe? This is... The picture of this thing, like how many times, right? The picture of this thing is like being out where there's rocks and there's smooth stones. And because they're kind of smooth, you don't see them. And all of a sudden, you're going along. And there's one, you know what I don't get? I hike along and I look down. And there's one stone sticking up in the whole path. How does my foot connect to that stone? There's plenty of space around it, but I'm not paying attention. Do you know what I feel right now? I feel like... There's not one stone in the middle of the path. There's like 20,000 stones in the middle of the path. Feels like there's a lot of things trying to trip us up. And when you, in language, add an A to the beginning of a word, it negates it. It means it says it's the opposite of that. That's this word. Where there's a smooth stone that's going to stub your foot, it says, rather than all these stones, stubbings, these trippings up. When God's people get together, they have not only joyful hearts, but their sincere hearts. Suddenly, all the stones of life seem to go away, which is exactly what it says in Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on his own under, in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and what? He will direct your paths or he will make your path straight. He's going to smooth out the rough spots. And when we're together, we come across somebody else that stubbed their toe on that same thing. And say, you don't have to do that. Let me tell you how your path can be straight. And God uses your story to help me so that I don't have to experience what you experienced. And that, that's, again, that's scripture. We comfort each other with the comfort by which we've been comforted. But you can't do that when you're not together. That's why I want so much more for everybody. So we be encouraged by all these things. The third thing that the church experiences or expresses is praise that leads to favor with people. It says, they were meeting together with glad and sincere hearts, verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Praising to God, where Christ gets lifted up. What happens when people isolate? is I find people, when they isolate, they start doubting God, they start being critical of God, or they start forgetting God. And in doing that, it's like, God's against me, look at me, poor me. I've been there, you've been there. But when the church is together, I, I love what one mom told us recently when she hears her kids complaining, she says, time out, you gotta give three praises for every complaint. I think we ought to make that a rule. I think that's great. 
Because negative stuff sticks longer than praise. But when God's people come together, we're here to glorify him and to say, I want to tell you what God did this week. Tricia, that was up here and talked to you about the, the upcoming block party that we're going to have. She wrote us this week, and I loved the joy that was in her mouth as, as she praised God. Because she, she went to one of the local grocery stores, and as she got there, she met up with a lady in the middle of Wegmans, and they're starting to talk. And as they're starting to talk, uh, they realize fellow believers. Another lady came up. Are you believers? I really have, I have this burden on my heart. Would you pray with me? They had prayer meeting in the middle of Wegmans. Hallelujah. You thought church was here. Church is wherever you go. And then she left and she went out in the parking lot and as she's driving away, she looks and she sees this lady with this big thing in, in a cart and she's struggling in the wind to get it to her car and figured she needs some help because it looked big. So she circles the parking lot and comes back to help the lady. The thing was as light as a piece of styrofoam, but it's okay. She was there to help. And as she got talking to the lady, she said, are you a Christian where you go to church? I go to church at Eastern Hill. You know, a pastor from there prayed for me one time. I think his name's Bennett. Pastor Dick. And so they had a conversation. But all I'm saying is, you see, when we focus on giving praise and glory and honor to the Lord, he will automatically do evangelism through the transformed people that are here. I'm not talking about just insider stuff that all we care about is us and nobody else. I'm talking about us being the people of God who are dream, truly being transformed by Jesus Christ and people see the difference and they'll ask and say, glad you asked. Now let me tell you why. And it's because of Jesus Christ and him crucified. I want more for people. And it says that as that takes place, it led to favor with all the people. Favor is the word charis. It's the word for grace. And God gave grace to the church as they were doing life among people. Remember in the Old Testament, Daniel? He and his friends were facing having to eat a diet that God said no to. And so they asked for favor and God gave them favor. And Daniel's influence over the next 60 years transformed and had an impact on the world power at that point in time. We as believers can have an impact on the nations of the world by being the people of God. And as he opens up opportunity, favor. We find as Peter and John do their things, you've gotta decide, but God gave favor when Paul was in need and he had problems with some other people. Alexander, the metal worker, done me great harm. I, I stood alone when I was in front of magistrates in Asia. Nobody stood with me, but Christ stood with me. God gives favor to his people even in the most desperate of situations. And when we are being the people of God and the spirit of God is working in us, God will give favor And God will transform our community because of it. I mentioned, so the, these are the things the church focused on. I mentioned a few weeks ago when President Trump almost was assassinated. You know, it, it's only by the grace of God he wasn't killed. I mean, you can't have a bullet that close and not being some angel or something there. But this isn't about Trump. It is about this. When you have a near-death experience, something happens. And everybody and their brother said something happened when he gave his next speech. And I mentioned that however long that lasts is determined by the next choices that are made. Listen. When I came to Jesus Christ at age seven, something happened. Because you see, it isn't a near-death experience. If you truly have come to Christ, you've got to die. You've got to die on the cross just as Jesus died on the cross for your sin. So you must take up your cross daily and die. Die. That means my agenda, my desires, and all the selfishness that is about me needs to be put to death at the cross so that the resurrection power of Jesus Christ can be unleashed in me. And that's what I desire for every one of us sitting here and everybody watching online and everybody that I know. 
Because that life is exciting. That life is amazing. That life breathes life. And that's what we have here. So we need to be together. So that's why we say, not only are we encouraging regular presence here, but we're talking about engagement. Over the next weeks, you're going to hear Not the next three weeks, we're going to be addressing some questions. But after that, as we get into our full rollouts, you're going to hear about some of the things that are necessary in our various ministries for us to engage, that we're not just people that come and and are here for the corporate time and then we're out doing other stuff. We're, We're not really engaged in any way with each other, but and we're missing your symphony parts when that happens. But I'm encouraging all of us to be engaged more to be involved with a small group. Because it's the small groups when we go house to house, that's where life sharpens life, and it's so vital. Uh, and, and, and we need to serve each other. Let me just tell you about a couple things that, that are necessary right now. In our next gen, and I got a great example of it this morning, we have a bunch of babies. So much so, they gotta, they gotta go into two rooms of babies because we got so many babies. But we got six or seven high schoolers that have been helping with all the babies and they're graduating and going to college. We need help with babies. And why I said this morning is a good thing. Pam saw 777. When you see 777 up here, that means we're in a heap of trouble. We need volunteers to come help. So Pam's not sitting back at her normal seat right now because she's over holding babies. And I said, thank you for serving. (laughs) We need people to care for them. We need other positions in Next Gen Field right now. We're gonna start an after school program in September, but what we found is the two schools that will reroute their buses to drop kids off here have so many options for after school that there's not as much of a need at those schools, but we have two other schools that are very close, but they can't and won't reroute their buses to bring the kids here, so we need people that will help use our van to go pick up kids to bring them for the after school program, and if we provide transportation, those kids are gonna be here. In fact, I heard at at, at Ledgeview, there's like 30 families on a wait list wanting an after school process. we need some people that'll step up and, and take about an hour probably till you get here, make sure the van's in good shape, drive to the school, pick up kids, bring them back. Their parents will pick them up from here later. That's all it is. We need some people that'll let us train you on our 15 passenger van and will come on, on part of a regular schedule and help bring kids here for an after school program. I had, as I brought that up last night, I had two or three people raise their hand. I felt like it was an evangelistic meeting. I see that hand, are there any others? It was really neat. We need people that'll step up and do that. Our tech department and worship arts, we need poor people that will help with sound and lights and and cameras back behind and broadcast. If you are technical at all, we can train you. We just need people that are willing to help with that and will help train you for that. We continually are in need of greeters and ushers, and I praise God for all of our folks that are involved in those ministries. I'd love to see some of you young guys get up here and help with those things so that you can help direct those families. The blog party and mega camp, all those things are upcoming, and those are single event kind of things, but we need prayer warriors. We need people that will help visit the sick and the hospital and the shut-ins. There's always needs that we have. And so, if you go to this, guys, could we bring up that slide? Uh, Thank you. We're gonna be pushing this over the next weeks and help you understand these things more. This isn't committing you to anything, but if you get that QR code, or there's a table out here, where you can go and you can see the various ways that you could serve, that we just need the whole body to engage. Because when we get together and we focus on teaching yes, both in large group and smaller group settings, and fellowship, doing life together, where we're providing for each other and giving to each other and and honoring each other and loving on each other and supporting each other, and we remember Christ and remember it's his death and resurrection that empower us and transforms us, and we pray together, 
when that happens, hell better look out because the church of Jesus Christ is rushing towards you. And I'm grateful that that is our God's heart and that is my heart for every one of us that we're involved in that way. Stephen's going to come and, and just play a little bit and I, I just want to lead us in a word of prayer and then the team's going to lead us in worship as we close out. Where are you in that, that whole process? How, how serious? Let me circle back to the illustration I gave. What if you were doing family life the way you do church? For some of you, that'd be great. You're there all the time. You can't wait to get back with the family. You want to be with the family. You're really fully engaged in the family. You're contributing to the family. Where are we with that? I'm not casting dispersions or stones or anything. I just want more for every one of us. I want us to know the love of God. He is giving giftedness to the whole church so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach maturity in the faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. Until we look like Jesus. That's his desire. To join me in praying. Father, I know the enemy could take words that I've given today or, or maybe wounded hearts would hear them as if I'm being negative in some way. I'm not at all. I just yearn for more. I know that you long to build your church. And you said the way that happens is if my people will focus on these things. And then I will open up all kinds of opportunities for as they go to make disciples. I, I, I will build my church, but I need the people in my hands whose hearts are steadfast towards me. Not that we're perfect yet, but we are in process. And our life is changed. There's so many ways that's reflected. Salt water and fresh water can't come out of the same tap. And yet when we listen to our voices, we sing praises and yet we curse. How's that possible? Well, it's because we're not fully transformed yet. How can we be so giving on one hand and so selfish on another hand? It's because we fully haven't died yet. But we're in process. So Holy Spirit, Move in each of our hearts. Search our hearts and know us. Try our anxious thoughts. See where those things that will trip us up are happening in our life and bring it to our attention so that we may confess it with the promise that when we confess that, you will not only fully forgive, but you'll purify us from it all so that we can run with perseverance the race that's set before us as we keep our eyes on Jesus who's out in front taking us in a headlong rush to transform the world because that's your desire. And help us now as we close out our time to truly worship you in spirit and in truth. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. stand together we're going to worship again and as we do I'd just like all of us to remember the purpose of being here today and the purpose that we have as a church in the body of Christ and that is to do life together that is to have a community and to be unified under the name of Jesus Christ join the song so long before our lives to raise 
a voice along heaven and earth alike. We've seen your faithful hand, your mercy without end, the King who bled. Of a thousand generations, you are worthy, Lord of all. We look to you, the slain and risen King. We lift our voice with heaven, singing, Worthy, Lord of all. Go through this life. Sing it. 